In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Divine wrath. God's anger, his burning anger, is what all sin, yours and mine, brings about. Divine wrath is God's justified response to the ways that we fail or refuse to love him and love our neighbors. It is what follows not just death, but in fact it is the second death of which the scriptures warn us. Divine wrath is very serious, and it is not to be ignored or put off or thought to be something that will simply go away. There is one solution to God's divine wrath. It is not a payment that we can make that would take eternity. That one solution is Jesus Christ, of whom we just sang, and the blood that he shed for us and for all the world. He is the only solution to us avoiding divine wrath and the second death. Jesus Christ came into our flesh and into our world in order to save us. We, of course, celebrate his birth for this reason. Every year we do it on December 25th. And a foundational aspect of this yearly celebration is knowing that he was born in order that nails, spear, would pierce him through the cross be born for me, for you. This is the satisfaction of God's wrath against our sin. And though the Father's description of these events in the Garden of Eden was not as plainly put as we sing in the hymn, What Child Is This? Jesus' words to his apostles tonight in our Gospel lesson, they leave really no room for confusion. As it starts, he says to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. This is short and to the point. He is telling them the very reason for his life and his work. He, in fact, is pointing them to the culmination of his life's work. And yet, as the verses that follow show us, his explanation on these important matters was not fully received or understood. We do well to note that this was, in fact, the third time that he had offered a prediction of his coming death and resurrection. And he tells his apostles about all of this as they make their way to where all of this is going to take place. And with this, he shows us once more his omniscience, his all-knowingness as God. He knew this was going to happen. He knew this was God's plan, the Father's plan for salvation. And he also knows the sin that lives in our hearts, in our minds, and plays forth in our lives. But as the gospel accounts unfold, we know that the disciples show their lack of omniscience as they witness all of these things that Jesus details for them come to pass and still do not believe, even after his resurrection. A small preview, then, of their full reaction to Jesus' arrest and the chaotic events that happened that night is offered here as the text continues. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. Yet again, we see here in this account a fitting reaction for any people when they are in the presence of God. We kneel at this rail for a reason. Jesus Christ is truly present here in the bread and the wine, his true body and blood. So this mother of James and John, she kneels to Jesus at Jesus and she makes a request. He said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right and one at your left, in your kingdom. Her request strikes us as very odd and even out of place. Why is she asking for them? And why is she asking for this? Jesus had spoken previously about the role the twelve would play in the life to come. 
Just one chapter before, he told them, all of them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so this mother's request is no doubt a follow-up. Along with Peter, James and John, her two sons, were in an observably closer circle with Jesus, especially when compared to the other disciples. He often took just those three to witness some of his most powerful miracles, including the raising of a young dead girl, and of course that mountaintop demonstration of his divinity at his transfiguration. So it seems like a natural conclusion that they are among the front runners to sit in positions of high authority with him. But Jesus does not meet their request. He answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, We are able. This cup that Jesus refers to is the cup of divine wrath the cup that waited for him at the cross on the outskirts of the city of Jerusalem. He alone can drink what is in that cup, and he can and did drink it completely, because he is God and man, the Son of Man and the Son of God. The suffering in that cup is damnation itself, being cut off from the Father's eternal love. That is the end result of our sin. It is the second death. But Jesus took that cup, and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There he endured the full wrath of the Father for our selfishness, for our sin, and he overcame it, just as he told them he would. He died the brutal death that he describes at the start of our reading, and three days later he rose again, as he predicted. This is what our faith, our Christian faith, is founded on. Paul, in fact, writes, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. But he has been raised, and he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father after drinking this cup that he now speaks of with James and John, that very cup that he asked to be removed as he prayed fervently in the Garden of Gethsemane. But in that prayer also, he submitted to the Father's will and showed his willingness to go through with what he speaks of as our reading concludes. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. Suffering is a part of following Jesus. Suffering is an important part of being one of his disciples, those who believe in him. And suffering would most certainly come for both James and John, that suffering of enduring in the faith. In fact, as we look at these two brothers, James is said to be the first of the apostles put to death for holding to and sharing our Christian faith. History points to his beheading under Agrippa I, roughly ten years after Jesus' death and resurrection. His brother John also would take from this cup of suffering, outliving all of the other apostles and seeing the many sadnesses and worldly influences that would sneak in or outright attack the church established by his Lord. You might remember John endured banishment and imprisonment on the island of Patmos because he would not stop giving witness to his faith. It's also there that he wrote the book of Revelation, which describes for us and names that second death. Though Jesus sees these realities in his conversation with these two brothers, even as he sees his own suffering and death before it takes place, we can recognize in this conversation that human pride and sinful desire for positions of authority often cloud the matters of our faith. This is visible in their mother's request and in the reaction of the other disciples as they overhear what is taking place. But it is also visible in our own lives. We want this world's praises. We want to fit in, to compete, to be found to be great and among the greater ones. 
We want how this world defines success and comfort. And we follow in its fallen culture in countless ways, setting our lives and our schedules around it. So we need to repent. And we need to look, rather, at Jesus' directive and his example. He says to us, Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. There are many, many opportunities in this broken world for us to seek after its ways and to struggle to obtain its very temporary treasures and pleasures. This is the way of sinful foolishness. Jesus calls us away from living it, and he gave up his life to free us from the ways that we fall into it in our sin. And though the world offers many such opportunities, there are many also here at St. John's and in our community to humbly serve those around us, setting aside our pride, our arrogance, our thinking so highly of ourselves, and instead reaching out with sacrificial love, knowing the divine wrath that our sin demands has been met and accomplished by our Savior Jesus Christ. He serves us with his victory through his humble means of grace, holy baptism, holy communion, and the holy scriptures. And in his gift of the Lord's Supper, he offers us a cup from which to drink. And what waits for us to drink from that cup at the altar is his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. In our drinking from that silver-plated chalice, we are spared of his divine wrath, and we are delivered instead the very medicine of immortality. Amen. We stand together now and sing our canticle hymn on page 934.